my my first impression to this image is is always um you know what what is the crowd gathering for what are they looking at what you know, it's such a large crowd and there's this sort of small window and you know what what can be happening that's bringing them together so what i like about this photograph is that it immediately raises all these questions for me um and kind of prompts you to 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 ask and like seek that information mm -hmm. sarah meister you want to tell us a little bit about this photograph uh sure uh you know as Tasha was saying, Lang leaves it somewhat ambiguous. Uh, so that they are gathered around a, re a relief window where I'm, some sort of assistance is being given out. Um, this was made while Lang was working for the Farm Security Administration, which was a government agency. So unlike, um, and I think one of the things that we should we could talk about that would be interesting is in the 1930s in particular, when were governments actually supporting photographers and poets and writers? And I, I think that would be something I'd like to return to later. So Lang was an employee of the federal government at this point. Um, I'm struck by the women in this picture, by the mixed races. We, we did in the, um, in the book, we, we use this as like the beginning of the plate section. I, I love it that much. And there we combine it with these words um, that L this is Lang talking about making this, making another picture. Actually, she was specifically speaking about making White Angel Breadline, but I think it applies across her practice. And she writes, you know, there are moments such as these when time stands still and all you do is hold your breath and hope it will wait for you. And you just hope you will have enough time to get it organized in a fraction of a second on that tiny piece of sensitive film. Sometimes you have an inner sense that you have encompassed the thing generally. You know then that you are not taking anything from anyone, their privacy, their dignity, their wholeness. And I think that idea of when eyes are covered or backs are turned or anonymity is preserved is, is one way of her expressing a, a signal of respect for the privacy of the people that she's photographing. What a great setup. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I want to call on Lily, Max, and Kamara to comment further on your first response to this. Uh, Lily, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think, to me, the most, like, my first impressions are to notice the um, similarities in everyone's stance, um, like all the people in, in the photograph. Um, there are, there seem to be like a set, um, I don't know, like a set group of postures, like hands in pockets, hands on hips. Um, I'm just thinking about how a photograph can convey the idea of waiting because like waiting happens in real time, but a photograph is an instant moment. And you can really see um, the length of time that these people have been here, even though it's just one instant captured. Yes, great, fantastic. That is absolutely good. Um, Kamara, your thought on this? Yeah, um, what strikes me in this photo of first impression are the contrast between like the geometry of like the windows or the doors and the the like somewhat fluidness of the the heads of people versus in the shadows um and the shadows specifically like have me thinking going off of what amber rose was talking about with the weather and sort of the environment the the shadows makes me think that something is you know the sun or something is affecting the growth of the shadow, but also it gets this feeling that there's there's more than what we see, that there's this effect that's longer than what we see here. Mm. Um, and also, uh, yeah, this it seems like there's a, a black man in the in the center. It's hard to the anonymity of it, the faces turn makes you not be able to see, but there's clearly a multiracial crowd and it seems like the darkest skinned person is in the sort of center of the frame all the way in the back and that struck out to me as well. Struck out to me think, as well. Do you think Kamara um 
we don't have evidence of this except our uh, intuition, but she must have taken several uh, shots of this, but this is the one that centered the black man who's also looking aside. The others are all looking right. to the window. How, uh, funny question to ask, but you'll interpret it benignly, I'm sure, uh, uh, because we talk about intention with at risk, but um, this was she, the intention to center this black man. Yes, pretty, pretty important. Yeah, I, I'd say. Yeah, um, so what do you think is the consequence of that? Because it is, it's somewhat integrated, but not maybe as much, you have to really work hard to see how integrated a group it is. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, um, yeah, no, I think that it is intentional, or at least the, the consequence of that for me is seeing that although that there is this crowd and the shadow makes it feel like there's this impending and growing or more than we can see crowd, um, yeah. there's still this black man who's in, for us, closest to the camera, but farthest in the back from the line, yeah. um, which seems yeah. to be making a historical I, point. Um, Max, what do you think? Um, what I wanted to comment on uh, was to, I wanted to start by going back to what Kate said earlier about the eyes and um, how uh, shielding the eyes is a way of rendering these crowds into a kind of rabble. And I absolutely think that's, uh, that's at play here. But also what I find really striking about this photograph is the way that some faces are offered in like tantalizingly in profile and you want to try to identify these folks and and also potentially identify with them and i think that's that's really what's what's quite brilliant about this photograph and about the on the question of diversity um yes i was also struck as sarah uh pointed out by the um at least compared to the other photograph we looked at by by the greater uh representation of, of gender and race that's happening here. Um, and also, you know, there's there's many people in the crowd here that we might not be seeing. There's also very interestingly, like a possible sartorial diversity that there's a, different styles and fashions represented here. And maybe somebody who's familiar with the era can talk about this, but it seems like different trades or different professions are being uh, referenced by the clothing here. I mean, there's a man in overalls with a hat. There's another man with a white fedora over to the left. Men with these sorts of flat newsboy caps. And I know that the the hats, especially at the time, were were big indicators of what your your station in life was or what your your profession yeah. or trade was. Uh, Calipatria, California, is way way in the southeastern corner, in the middle of that county there. And the average temperature, high temperature in the summer, is 107 in the low low temperature in the winters, like in the 40s, this is obviously fall or spring. Um, the sun just beats down everything. They get no rain. You can almost tell from the ground. Um, hats are crucial. You get the feeling that the pot, it's, it's also 1937, not 1933. The New Deal has been implicitly through its economic policies and through the FSA, pushing racial equality as best it can, and you get more integrated scenes of relief by 1937 than you do in 1933. But I can't help going back to Amber Rose's thinking about the seasons and the weather, that the extreme weather makes integration or racism not, at such moments, not as crucial to white racists as it might be in a situation where it isn't 107 degrees. And, you know, just it strikes me that the weather almost makes integration a little easier. That's just, there's, I'm just winging it there. Sarah, well, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I actually, first of all, I just wanted to add, you know, we, in the Lang book for the words and pictures, we had 12 contemporary artists, writers, thinkers, poets, um, and Christina Sharp was one of them who contributed to this book. So just, I wanted to, as soon as you said her name, I was like, oh, hello. I mean, you know, it, the, her decision, you know, she's an incredibly in-demand uh, writer, thinker, and her saying yes to this, to me, signaled a really, um, a sense of what Lang holds the, and these pictures hold for all of us as a society. So I just wanted to bring yes. that up. I think um, one of the things to, uh, the sartorial observation is a really great one, and I do I, you know, there are lots of, this is in February, so this is probably in the cooler months there. I think 
the variety of the hats and the clothes reflect the diversity of the migrant workers in California, which actually preceded um, any of the any of the aid that was being offered. So Lang's first work that she did for the state government of California in early 1935, so two years before this, was um, includes this wonderful page from the Library of Congress where she writes, all races serve the crops in California. And so there was a Japanese population, a Filipino population, Mexican workers, African-American workers. And by 1937, um, the exodus from the Dust Bowl across the United States from the, so you really do, I think that observation that these people are wearing different kinds of clothes to, to um, here gather aid, but in other pictures to work in the fields, um, those reflect that uh, wide variety of places that, you know, California was a magnet for um, all of this.